Komap uh, Sumida, Brother Chung. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, sweet way to bring the spirit in. <clears throat> and thanks for President Sister Kush for hosting Karen and I today. We're so grateful to be here and grateful to be with you, Ensign College. Uh, I've been asking about some of you and reading some of your stories and uh, hearing about how you came to be here and how many of you have overcome so much and worked hard to be here. I believe all of you have amazing stories. I love stories. I love watching them. I love listening to stories. I love listening to other people tell them. I've told them myself over the years. In fact, I've worked my entire professional life in and around the business of stories. And there is this moment in stories where the audience lets themselves go. I love this moment when we surrender to our story. I love the moment when the images leave the screen and the audience rises up to meet them. I love it when the music leaves the speakers or our earbuds and it comes into our heads. I love that we love to experience each other's stories. I love that we let each other's stories move us and inform us and impact us in our thinking. But I do have a quick warning. Sometimes just listening to the stories of others can get us sidetracked. To be sure, there are a lot of smart people out there and a lot of collected wisdom we can benefit from in TED Talks and speeches and classrooms and social networks. But let's face it. Ideas and understandings change over time, and the thing that everyone's talking about today can evolve tomorrow. And to complicate that even further, as you know, validation and self-interest have become a huge part of the equation. Of course, we all seek validation in different ways during our lives. But now, maybe more than any time in history, there is a motivation for validation. More than ever, there are more folks whose actual job it is to be popular. This sharing culture driven by social currency and the economy of clicks and likes and subscribes and validation is too often what drives the sharing of thoughts and ideas with each other. But I believe that you and I know that in, our, in the heart of our hearts that there's something more than that. We know that there's something greater than all of us, right? So in the church, and at least weekly, in settings like this and others, we gather to read and reflect on stories that help us look beyond ourselves. Stories both current and recorded throughout millennia. And some of these stories we even gather up and write down, and a few of those stories we even set aside and canonize as scripture, and we set them apart from other stories. But the point of going to church and reading the scriptures and listening to others is not just to believe them or believe the stories, but to take from them. We're not just to listen, envy, judge, or blindly obey the stories or the voices telling the stories, but we're to listen for the voice of God in the stories and how that connects to the divine gift in us. When President Kush asked you to read, uh, raise that up. He's asking you to take advantage of that moment so that when we gather and share and listen to stories, what we're listening to is what the div divinity is trying to tell us about our story, about our journey, and the divine truths that we're reclaiming as part of our journey. So I hope that as we share stories today that you and I can feel and hear and seek the divinity that is offered to us and the divinity that's inside of us. And so with that, I'm going to tell you a story, if that's okay. When I was a boy, we lived in a little house in Huntington Beach, California, and it had sort of a flat roof. And it was the kind of roof where frisbees and footballs thrown by four and six-year-old boys could get stuck pretty easily. So one time, when we must have run out of all of those footballs and frisbees, I remember my dad was going to send us up on that roof to, to get our stuff. And near the porch, there was this place where they had a lower corner that made this possible. If my dad lifted us up over our head, over, over his head, sorry, he, we could scramble onto that roof and, and, get those, and, and get up off our bellies and get the frisbees and footballs. And I get this isn't a really ter ter terribly safe idea to send your little boys up there. And none of you should report my dad to, to social services for doing it. But that's what we did. And I got up first because, you know, I'm the older brother. 
And then, of course, my little brother had to get up with me. So my dad lifted him up over his head, and my brother scrambled up. And I think I even helped him a little bit, you know, because I'm a good older brother. But I don't think I realized how high up I would feel until we turned around and started to throw the stuff off the roof. I'm guessing that with each throw, it reinforced in my mind how high up we were, at least. In my mind, the time came and our task was done and I turned around. And I remember beginning to realize at that moment the reality of my predicament. How would we get down? Well, my dad's solution was, jump, I'll catch you. And that didn't seem like a very good idea to me. And as I just stood there thinking about what a bad idea it was to jump off the roof and into the air, and I was trying to figure out, I think, even if my dad really would or could catch me, just then, whoosh, my little brother came running past me and he leaped out into space into my dad's arms. In my mind's eye, I can still see my little brother moving away from me in the air through space, spread eagle and back arched and arms outstretched, squealing at the thrill of being able to fly. I thought, was he crazy? Is he insane? My stomach cramped with those kind of feelings, I remember. So after putting my giggling little brother down, <clears throat> my dad looked up at me with his arms open like it was my turn. No way was I going to jump off that roof. I was frozen. And after a few minutes, I think we must have had the, well, then how are you going to get down talk? And the only thing I could think of was to go back down the way I came. So I got down and back on my belly and I started to scoot out towards the S legs first. And I can still imagine the scraping of the asphalt and the little gravelly stones as I sort of scooted my belly out off to the edge. And I can imagine my dad reaching up and trying to corral my kicking and squirming legs. I can still imagine my hands clinging and scraping the last inches of the roof as he pried me from the roof. I wonder what he thought. He must have smiled at my plan. It wasn't the safest way to get down, but that was the only way I think I could. I wanted to jump off that roof like my brother, but I couldn't for some reason. So was I not brave enough? Was I not trusting enough? For the rest of our growing up, I couldn't do what my brother could do. He learned to do back handsprings and backflips and tumble. He did all sorts of things that took courage or stupidity or leaps of faith or whatever. And depending on how, how you look at it, I think I was always jealous of his bravery. For many years, when I've thought about faith in my life, I've thought about that story. And there are one or two lessons that have developed for me over time. The first is this. We are all different and our journeys are different. My brother and I love each other very much. But I think that as I grew up, sometimes, maybe even many times, my wishing I was more like him got in the way. Not just of our relationship, but got in the way of my own journey and my own growth. Whose way was the right way? Was I more mature and smarter and enlightened about the science of gravity? Or was my brother just braver, brimming with faith and belief and trust that I didn't have? As I watched my mom and dad over the years, it became really clear to me that not only did the differences not matter to them, but they loved our unique strengths and our stories. The most important thing to them is that we love and learn and grow. That's what my parents were watching for. And I think it's the same with our heavenly parents. They love our unique journey. Second, I've also come to learn that faith really is a journey and it's not an either or. It's more like a story. There's a lot more to the story than a lot of faith and a lot of doubt. So faith is a story and faith is your unique story. So what makes faith more than just a leap. So in my career in and around the business of creating stories, there's this interesting idea, and it's interesting to me how many times we have to remind ourselves that stories actually need a beginning, a middle, and an end. I know that seems simple to say, but we have to remind ourselves all the time of this. And at the heart of every story that there's this journey, there's a process, there's a transformation. In story making, sometimes we call this the hero's journey where the hero departs, meets challenges, overcomes obstacles, and then returns changed. Does that sound familiar to you? 
A beginning, a middle, and an end. How many of you here were, were here just a few mo- months ago for Elder Bruce and Sister Marie Hafen speaking about the stages of faith? Do you remember that? Do yourself a favor if you haven't. Go back and read either their book or watch that devotional. But interestingly, they organized the stages of faith or the story of faith into three parts. Sort of a beginning, a middle, and an end. They explained that at the beginning, the nature of our faith is belief in the ideal. Simple and beautiful. And then in the, in the middle of our journey, we encounter the reality of things. Life hits us in the face and the idealism of our belief collides with the glare of the reality of things. What we believe and hope for and what our experience gives us seem incompatible. The Hafens then describe a process of traveling and working and walking through the middle of that story to another place on the other side a place more settled in a developed, integrated, chosen, and earned faith. To me, they are describing a hero's journey, a beginning, middle, and end sort of story. So as it turns out, there's actually science that backs this journey up. As we grow, our brain physically develops to be able to process things even differently than when we're younger. Not just more, but differently. Not only do we gain the ability to learn and choose for ourselves, but our brain also develops the capacity to hold on to complex things like dichotomy and paradox at the same time. Here's what I mean when I talk about dichotomy and paradox. Is justice or mercy more important? Here's another example. I believe in and stand up for something completely different than you do, but I still love you and I value you, and I support you, that can feel like a sort of paradox to us. Our instructors and leaders and speakers are just people, and they make mistakes all the time, just like me, just like everyone. But there can be some wisdom and even divine truths in the things they share. How is that possible? Our closest family and friends are imperfect creatures. They drive us crazy. But they're also a great truth for our own growth. It's hard to get our mind around that. We are imperfect believers, so the church itself is naturally flawed. But the church is also a beautiful vehicle given to us for communing in Christ's perfection. Joseph was flawed, but divine truth was restored through him. Two things seemingly at odds can be true at the same time. When our brain begins to consider these colliding realities, we are traveling the great middle of our faith story. Luckily, our brain develops along the same time to be able to hold on to and walk through and process and reconcile these things. And because all these things shall give us experience and shall be for our good, our journey with faith can take on more color now, more complexity, more agency, and more meaning. And that leads me to another thing that has to happen in stories. The hero on the journey must act and decide. In the face of the environment and the situations and the external forces, our hero has to take on what the journey brings. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. And so our hero, the hurdles, oh sorry, and so for our hero, the hurdles, the obstacles, The complex problems and the challenges are all part of the story. Our hero's reactions to them are keys to the story. Keys to the hero's transformation. So remember, this is your story. You are the protagonist. You are the hero. But it might be easy at this point to misunderstand that very important part of the story. It might be easier to decide that your role is to be judge instead of hero. It might be easier for you or I to sit back and say, well, convince me, God. Convince me to believe in you. Convince me that I'm a spiritual being on this journey. Convince me that there is mystery in reason. Convince me that there can be faith in doubt. Convince me that there is mercy in justice. Convince me that there is beauty in ashes. Convince me 
that an open heart is as important as an open mind. Convince me, Lord. But we are not here to say convince me. This is our journey and we are not here to sit on the sidelines of the journey in the bleachers or the spacious buildings like some sort of judge trying to determine if the journey is even valid. Our role is not like a judge or a referee or to even judge the referee like a spectator. We are the protagonists in the hero's journey. We are not here to be convinced. We are here to choose. We are here to choose and be changed by our choices. It is better for us, Eve teaches in the temple. That is how the hero is made, or rather remade, transformed, or redeemed. Okay, so what does choosing and changing look like exactly? Well, we already know that it's not one moment of leaping from a roof, but it's a journey of choices. The hero won't be transformed until they choose over and over again. And every choice may not be a leap, but it's almost certainly like a step into a dark room before the light turns on, before we know the outcome. It's always a brave step. Scripture stories call it an experiment. A choice in the midst of darkness or doubt, a desire to believe. It's the, I don't know the meaning of all things, but I know this moment. A neighbor and friend, Sister Isabel Peterson, just recently gave a talk in church when she left on her mission. And what she said spoke to my soul when she said, a believer is someone who takes action. Then she quoted, be thou an example of a believer. Our hero typically has to ask themselves, am I a believer? What would a believer do right now? Okay, so another thing we might ask ourselves is what if I decide not to choose? What if I decide not to be the hero or to act in my story? Well, here's the thing, you will. You have to, because the story is actually moving all around you. Does that make sense? It reminds me of a river. And with that, I'm gonna tell you another story. How many of you know what running a river is? Anybody know what running a river is? How many of you run a river? There was a time in my life that I had never actually run a river. I had floated on a river in a tube, but running a river is different. Here's what I mean. Uh, back when Karen and I were newlyweds, our former YSA bishop had also been a Colorado river guide. And he took the ward on an adventure outing to run a river. And he invited us back as newlywed chaperones just months after we'd gotten married. And when we got there, it turned out that one of the boat guides for one of the boats couldn't come. So our friend asked us if I would be willing to guide one of the boats. Well, I'd never run a river, remember? I'd never been a river runner or a guide even. And uh, okay, these weren't like class five rapids or the heart of the Grand Canyon or anything, but there were rapids and bumps and we were gonna get bounced around and tossed around. And I had only ever floated in a tube in a river. So I wasn't that confident. And Karen, by the way, for sure knew I didn't know what I was doing. But our friend and our guide assured us that we'd, be all, we'd all be okay. And then he told us this last remaining thing. When we get into the river, there will be some rapids, but don't worry your boat will be okay. And as we approach the rapids, just fall, line up behind me and follow my line into the rapids and you'll be fine. Oh, and then he adds, oh, and by the way, keep telling everybody in your raft to stay in the boat and rowing so you can steer. So I guess it turns out you have to be in the boat and rowing in order to steer the boat. Well, it got bumpy and we were tossed around and I kept saying, keep rowing and we kept rowing and we made it through and we had a ball. So here's the lesson. Even though it was bumpy, even though we got tossed around, we didn't think anything was broken. We didn't say, hey man, this river's broken. My boat is broken. Something's wrong with this river because we're getting tossed around. Well, that'd be silly to say in the middle of a river run. And in that way, our story is like a river run. For sure there are times when something really is wrong and you need to reach out for help when that's true. But very, very often, 
The bumps in the rapids that you and I are feeling are just part of the story. And our hero's journey is to navigate and choose our way through them. With all of that choosing and steering, we are transformed along the way. You see, sometimes we think that life is happening to us, but it's actually happening for us. The journey was created for us and we were made for it. So remember, this is a hero's journey, an unfolding story with beginnings, middles, and ends. And you were uniquely created by divine parents. This is your unique story. And you are who you need to be for this story. You were built for this story. You were built for this river. Your boat is not broken and the river is not broken. Don't try to scramble back up river or flee to the sides. Embrace the river. Remember, we're here to choose. We're not here to sit back and say, convince me. So show up in your story. Keep your oar in the water and be the hero of your journey so the journey can transform you. Here's the great news for you. You are a generation who loves to learn by experience. And that happens to be the doctrine. Use that to your advantage. I really do think you were born for this story at this time in history. You were made for this river. There's one more thing we haven't talked about yet. Remember our bishop and river guide friend? Remember how he said to follow his line down the river and especially in the rapids? You've probably guessed by now that there's another character in the story, another force. Christ is in the story with us. His role in our story can take on many dimensions, but we have to decide that too. Christ is always there for us in many ways, whether we choose to acknowledge that or not, because for sure the spirit of Christ is given to all. But Christ invites you and I to take up our cross, our story, our oar, and follow him. If we choose to follow Christ, if we choose to take on his name, to receive him, if we align ourselves with him, if we immerse ourselves in him, if we always remember him, then there's something more that comes to us, even more than peace and comfort as we follow his line through the rapids. It's the promise of baptism and the sacrament prayer. His spirit will always be with us. His divinity merges with the spark of the divine that's in us, reawakening it and giving it new life and new birth. This is how we're born again in the spirit. This is how we receive it. Our choosing and steps become sanctified by him. I am in the Father and ye in me and I in you, Christ promises to us. Does that feel true to you? Does that ring true to you? Can you feel the divinity of that resonating with the spark inside of you? Can you feel God speaking to you? Maybe it's like a little highlighter in your heart. Maybe it comes and goes. Maybe it's gentle. Maybe it's burning. Maybe it's fleeting. But remember, it's unique to you. Can you only hope to believe today? Let this work in you. Act as if you believed. Take your step, immerse your oar in the water and see if you feel more of the divine in you. Follow Jesus and take the steps a believer would take and he will help you and sanctify your steps. I love this quote from Sister Lisa Harkness. Our faith grows as we experiment on the word of God with hope and diligence, trying our very best to follow Christ's teachings. Our faith increases as we choose to believe rather than doubt, forgive rather than judge, and repent rather than rebel. Our faith is refined as we patiently rely on the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah." End quote. And President Nelson has invited us, you might remember, to start today to increase your faith. And he then gives us these steps to study, to choose to believe in Jesus Christ, to partake of ordinances, 
and to ask Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ for help. And President Nelson also recently reminded us that, quote, overcoming the world is not an event that happens in a day or two. It happens over a lifetime as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. The Lord doesn't require a perfect faith to have access to his perfect power, but he does require us to use our agency to choose to believe and to show up for our story. So let's show up for our story, not just with open minds, but with open hearts. Not to feel guilty for who we are not, but to use our agency to take the hero's journey and be transformed. Let us choose. Choose to not only believe in God, but choose to know God and choose to love God. May we all choose God and be changed by our story and our choices is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.